What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 30 of the Drunken Boxing Podcast coming to you from Beijing. I have a great episode for you today. So let's first cover some other things before we get into it. Let me once again promote a company located here in China, up in Dalian, which produces excellent swords. The Hanwei Sword Company has a long history, being first established in 1990, and with that, are one of the most experienced bladesmiths in the field here. While the company is well known overseas, I am still surprised when I speak to people who are not familiar with them, particularly Chinese martial artists. Hanwei Forge produces not only Chinese style swords and weaponry, but they also produce Japanese swords as well as European types. They are meticulous about their products and have a high standard of quality that they adhere to, which sets them apart from many such companies. Personally, I have some of their swords and I highly recommend their products. They range from basic entry-level items all the way up to exquisite collector's pieces. So you may view their products at their official website, which is hanweimetal.com. So the website is in Chinese. It is, however, quite self-explanatory. And the general manager, Mr. Gilbert Poon, can speak English and is highly accommodating to customers. So if you have any queries or would like to contact them for an order, you may do so by email at gilbertpoon at hanweimetal.net. I'll put these links in the show notes and description. Okay, and for those of you wanting to study the wonderful Mandarin language, there is an online option to do this. To that end, I can recommend eChinese Learning. They are a well-established company based in China and operating internationally, and they offer one-on-one online language training for people wishing to learn Chinese. They offer tailor-made programs based on each person's individual needs, whether they are looking to pass Chinese language proficiency tests or for work or just to learn it as a hobby for everyday Chinese. Being a professional company, they are available for you to set up your lessons at any time that suits you, 24-7, which is quite useful if you have a tight schedule. All their teachers are professional language teachers, and they are well-established in the industry. Listeners of the Drunken Boxing Podcast can sign up for a free trial lesson, no strings attached, by going to the link listed in both the show notes and the description today. If you are keen on learning the Chinese language, give them a try. All right, let's get into some Mushin martial culture news. I released a very special episode of Sengi, which I produced on a recent trip to the Inner Mongolian grasslands, where I visited Lavelle Marshall, who has moved there to study Mongolian wrestling, or Boch, deeply. I highly recommend it if you are interested in learning about Mongolian culture and wrestling, as well as uh, hearing some wonderful insights from Lavelle and his experiences. I also released a new episode of the Martial Parks of Beijing, this time featuring the Temple of the Sun, or Rutan Park. Also, the second part of my interview with Xu Xiaodong was also released. I have some other interesting projects that will be released in the coming period, including the third episode of The Hidden History of Shuai Jiao, as well as the second episode of my trip to Inner Mongolia. Except in the second episode, um, it will focus on pioneering women in these wrestling arts. So keep an eye out. In other fronts, I have released some new Mushin merchandise. I worked for quite some time finalizing a design which features the Great Spear, and I'm very happy with how it came out. There are various color combinations available in both hoodies and t-shirts, as well as a coffee mug. As my core art is Xing Yichuan, the spear holds a very special place in my heart. So I hope you guys find these items as special as I do. I will also be releasing a poster that will be available. It's a design of this image based uh, on the style of older imperial art. So keep an eye out for that. All these items will be available and are available currently on the Mushin Martial Culture Teespring store, uh, links to which are in the show notes. Also, your support on Patreon enables me to continue to produce the content that I do. And I'm truly thankful for all and any support. If you enjoy my endeavors and would like to pledge some support for the podcast or the channel, you may do so through the Patreon site. The Patreon site may be found at patreon.com slash Mushin Martial Culture. That's all one word, Mushin Martial Culture. And for those of you that are looking to study the arts of Xing Yichuan and Bagua Zhang, on the Mushin Patreon site, apart from the general support tiers, you will find a third tier, the Hua Jin tier, which is the online learning tier. Here you have the ability to study the arts of Xing Yichuan and Ba Gua Zhang from me through a comprehensive program which features in-depth lesson videos and learning support. The lesson content on the platform is continually growing. Okay, on to today's episode. My guest today is none other than Daniele Bolelli, who is a martial artist, writer, and a university professor of history. He's the host of two of my favorite podcasts, namely the Drunken Taoist podcast, as well as History on Fire. History on Fire, along with Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, are my favorite history-related podcasts, and I highly recommend them. More recently, Daniele produced a series of podcasts about Bruce Lee, which were fantastic. Over and above that, Daniele is a lifelong martial artist who has years of experience in various arts. 
including Kung Fu Sansu and Judo, both of which he holds black belts in, as well as Xing Yichuan and Ba Gua Zhang, which he studied under Tim Cartmill, and he also practices Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to boot. Needless to say, he has experience in a wide range of practices at a high level. He is also the author of a few books, including On the Warrior's Path and Not Afraid. I read On the Warrior's Path many years ago, and I enjoyed it very much. Links to his books are in the notes as well. Daniele has been a guest on the Joe Rogan podcast in the past quite a few times. Anyway, I really enjoyed my discussion with him. So with that, I give you the great Daniele Bolelli. Okay, welcome to the Drunken Boxing Podcast, Daniele Bolelli. I'm honored to have you on my on my podcast. Um, I've been an avid follower of your works for many years, your podcasts, both of them, which I highly enjoy. I've uh, read your books. I've seen interviews and things that you've... Uh, that you've uh, discussed and written and um, highly honored to have you on the show as a as a fellow martial artist that I know that you are but also as a very interesting human being so welcome thank you so much and uh, I dig the fact that the beginning of the title of your podcast and one of mine is identical because uh, I have the drunken Taoist so that seems perfectly fit in here yeah actually I was thinking about that earlier and I mean you know, I, I the naming of my podcast was originally because I wanted to do them in person. And when I started them two years ago, the idea was to have two martial artists drinking and talking about martial arts. So hmm, drunken boxing, you know, but uh, Corona, Perfect. yeah, Corona got in the way of that. And I haven't been able to really do them in person with with people that I'd wanted to do them with for the last couple of years. So we do the virtual drunken boxing and um, it's not as much fun, though, whereas when you're, you know, when you're sitting down face to face, having a drink and and talking about these things. Of course. But but of your, course. you brought yours up, which uh, maybe for some of the listeners of my podcast that aren't familiar with yours, you could you could introduce your works. Sure. Um, I did. Uh, I'm somewhat eclectic in the kind of stuff I do. I, I've written four books uh, about very different topics. Martial arts fe- feature prominently in about one and a half of them. One is entirely about martial arts and philosophy. One is more a bit about my life, including a strong element about martial arts and a couple have nothing to do with it. And then instead, in terms of podcasts, the two main ones that I host are one is called The Drunken Taoist, which um, Honestly, Drunken Taoist, it's, uh, it can go in any direction because it's pretty much whatever we feel like talking about on any given day, which there's a ton of Taoism in there, but there's also life, the universe, and everything in between, so there's not a single topic. Whereas the other podcast that I host, History on Fire, is just me, no interviews, no dialogue, it's just me doing a deep research into one historical topic, and then telling the tale, hopefully in a way that it feels like you're watching your favorite TV show kind of thing, where you're at the edge of your seat. I mean, and it's not like dramatizing it, it's just that's how history is if you tell it halfway decently. So yeah. that's kind of what I do uh, with History on Fire. All of those are great endeavors and highly recommended to people. And um, I mean, I'd like to talk a little bit about each one of them. The Drunken Taoist podcast, you named it after somebody that you... you you revere somebody that you you look up to, somebody that you see as a role model. Um, could you talk about that a little bit? So one of my idols is uh, E.Q. Sojun, the um, Zen master from, uh, he was born in the late 1300s and then mostly through the 1400s. And uh, he's just, uh, he's hilarious because he was the legitimate son of the emperor of Japan. He ended up, uh, not by choice, but because his mom had no other option, she put him in a Zen monastery. And he grew up there, and precisely because he was a brilliant guy with a fantastic grasp of Zen, he ended up clashing a lot with the Zen establishment. And his main passions for the rest of his life were Zen, women, and drinking. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I love EQ because he's uh, really deep, but also really fun at the same time. And so sometimes we are blackmailed into this idea that fun and death are completely different things. Mm. And instead, EQ is a guy who had a blast. He managed to have an incredibly fun life, um, had a tremendous impact on the Japanese cultural history, but in, in the process, just enjoying life, you know, and yeah. being, uh, I don't know, he's a... 
refreshing because so often we run into stories a lot like the tortured artist and in order to have intensity you need to be this tortured soul yeah which don't get me wrong of course there's some truth to that but it's also nice to be reminded that just because you have intensity doesn't mean that you are condemned to a life of misery and suffering you can also enjoy life yeah and of course intensity can go both ways it can create beauty but it can also create total destruction and uh, some of the darkest parts of uh, human history and we've seen that with characters in in the past as well so it goes both ways. Yep. I quite I quite like that about um, EQ as well. And it's also been my experience. I mean, training with a lot of Chinese martial artists here in China, older generation people. We have this idea that comes out of a comic book or a Kung Fu movie that, uh, you know, there are these... Uh, these people that uh, are totally pure, they don't drink and, uh, you know, you get the idea of some of the, the religious aspects. They don't eat meat and uh, they, they don't uh, get angry, and but they're human like everybody else. And in fact, you know, I've said this before, but some of the, the, the pillars of traditional martial arts practice are drinking, fighting, swearing and, well, in some cases, womanizing, you know, and that's been my experience. Yep with a lot of these these people here. And they're some of the most pure people and the most down-to-earth people that you'll meet precisely because of this. You can relate to them, you know? So, yeah, this is great. Very much so, very, very much so. You mentioned That's that... That's what to me keeps Yeah, go it, ahead. Uh, like... Go ahead, sorry oh, about ahead. this. No, 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 there's a bit of a delay, but go ahead. Oh, I... Where I was going with it is that sometimes I feel that... Um, we tend to separate spirituality, philosophy from just being down to earth and uh, being more kind of be more straightforward, being more. And I think that's a huge mistake. I think that real spirituality is uh, found in playing with your kids, is found in uh, enjoying nature, is found in things that are, are not just, you know, you're sitting in a monastery cloud incense kind of thing mm. but that it can be found in the midst of daily life yeah yeah totally you know um you also said something about eq that he he started clashing with the established zen authority and the establishment of the the monastery and the religion in japan and i think that that might actually be some inherent trait of zen in itself to a degree i mean we find this quite commonly with zen um, that they're anti anti establishment or anti what you perceive to be the way things should be in a in in a, in a way that they seek enlightenment or have found enlightenment through that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and uh, I, I I think really there's something refreshing about it because so often we are just sold. Uh, what are essentially stereotypes, mm. and uh, it's never good to live up to a stereotype, no matter how attractive it may be on some levels. There's it, there, the cage is not too far. It's always very clear the, its limits, and I think the more we stay away from it and we are authentically human at 360 degrees, the better off we are. Mm. Well, I want to ask you something, and this is something that I've been thinking about with regards to this and, and the connection to martial arts, but in general with, with this method, do you think that there is some sort of uh, uh, a method to this, this type of, well, let's not call it madness, but a method to this process that in fact, in the beginning, it might actually be that somebody needs these structural constraints of do this, do not do that read this do not yeah. read that and then the goal is not to stay there but eventually to break out of it so in in essence iq was doing exactly what he's required to do to actually go to go further to expand to go further down that path and and would you say that that's true with 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 that and and even with martial arts 100 percent i think is in order to transcend structure you need to have to be at least a little familiar with structure mm. so yeah you should uh, that's why i felt like the whole bruce lee thing of like moving beyond the styles that's great but it's probably not a bad idea to start with a style to start with something that has uh they give you a grounding and you know, rules, again, rules are made to be broken, but you should understand what you're breaking. You know, yeah. you should have a deep understanding of its limitation. And the way you develop deep, deep understanding is usually by toying with them, by playing a little with them, by sticking with them even for a while. And then you can realize, you know what, the rule is good from year to year, but there are these cases, these cases, and these other cases where it's not. Yeah. So maybe let's not apply it where it doesn't belong. 
And I think that's where, you know, you develop the wisdom to know when to reject the rules and when to incorporate them. Where, because otherwise, if it's just about rejecting all rules, you are free from day one, it's almost like you don't even know, you don't even know what to do with that freedom, mm -hmm. you know? Yes, agree, agree. I think, I think we see this a lot when people look at, uh, and you mentioned Bruce Lee, particularly Bruce Lee. Uh, there have been others, but I think he's the mm -hmm. most prominent figure in that regard. But, um, and they take it without understanding the basis upon which he built that on, which was an experience that was uniquely his own. Uh, but he had gone yep. through some structure, some understanding of structure, method, and then transcended it. And some people try to jump to step two. I think... I think some people can, don't get me wrong. There might be some, but they are very, very sure. few and far between. The majority of people need some sort of a, a, a roadmap and, you know, a framework that is somewhat restrictive to initially begin the path. And then from there, yeah. things things will, will change. And I think it's the same with a lot of religion today. Um, and um, it's not simply just uh, philosophical religions or philosophy-based ideas, but also structural, well-known religions that sometimes get stuck in that same thing of constraints. And then they look at everything through the, those constraints and never transcend them. And, and, well, that's part of the problems that we have today, I suppose. Yeah, I think there's, uh, in that sense, Taoism would be done with it, because ultimately it is about finding a line between... Uh, it's about balance. So mm. you want a balance between structure and innovation. Too much structure becomes dogmatic and it represses individuality. Mm -hmm. Too much innovation and zero structure can be dispersive and uh, lacking focus. So it's like in everything, it's not that it's good or bad in and of itself, is how far you take it. You're right. And the balance may change in life. You know, at some point in life, you may need more structure. At other points in life, it's time to move beyond it. And you wouldn't be doing a service to yourself or to anyone else by sticking with it. Uh, so it's a, I think that's one theme that's really interesting about Taoism is the idea that balance is a constantly it's in a dynamic state. It's mm. a constantly shifting thing. It's never something that's written in stone that balance means you need to be 50-50 between two extremes at all times. Right. No, not at all. Balance is uh, between, there's a zero to a hundred scale and you can be anywhere on that scale at that particular moment. I, I always use the metaphor of surfing, right? When mm. you look at a surfer, they are never, or very rarely they are perfectly in the middle of the board. At some moment when the ocean is pushing a certain way, their body is almost 90% on one side of the board. It looks like they are going to fall off, but they are balancing off that wave. Three seconds later, the balance has changed. And so they are no longer, if they try to stay in that position, they are going to fall off and they need to adapt yet again. And so to me, that's why most things in life work that way, where you have to constantly course correct, constantly adjust to find the right balance. I think that's a great analogy because it's so it's so relevant to to life. I mean, life throws things at you that you don't know. And if you tr if you're, you know, stubbornly trying to stay in the middle, you're not going to be able to deal with it. It might actually destroy you. Whereas if you're able to yep. shift as needed, you're going to be able to deal with it and well, ride that proverbial wave that you just mentioned a lot better instead of getting drowned and knocked over. So, yeah, yeah that's really good. And I mean, this you, you come from a martial arts background yourself um you know i know you yeah. you, you grew up in italy um c could you talk a little bit about your background sure so i'm 47 now i started training martial arts when i was 17. i was introduced to uh I initially like the first few years of being primarily in chinese martial arts yeah. Actually, more than a few, because I started back in Italy with some Chinese martial arts style, but I couldn't find one that I dug. So I kept switching from one to another for probably about 40 years. Wow. About 40 years in, I went, when I was 21 and I had moved to U.S. in the meantime, I started training into this style called, uh, well, it's called a bunch of things. It's, it's, a, it's a Southern Chinese system. Mm sometimes referred to as Toili Ho Fu Tung, as five families, but it's in U.S. it's called Kung Fu San Su, which really doesn't mean much because it's yeah. kind of the same as saying Sancho, but it's not the sport of Sancho. It's more likely than not, based on what I've seen, is a variation on Choi Li Foot. Okay. But um, 
you know, there are disagreements about that, but it is clearly a Southern Chinese style that came from this one guy, Jimmy Wu, brought his family style to US and modified it over time. And that's what I started studying. I, I had a good time with it. Mm. I trained it for a long time. I mean, I still work with it occasionally. I started then moving into other Chinese arts. I did uh, a good chunk of Tai Chi. I did uh, started moving into Bagua and Xingyi. Okay. And uh, eventually around that time, I was studying Bagua and Xingyi with Tim Cartmel. I was a phenomenal martial artist. Yes. I really like yes. the approach to sing. He's, uh, he's both really smart as a person and really skilled as a martial artist. And he was going through his transformation from being primarily focused on Chinese martial arts. That's when he was going through his uh, early Brazilian jiu-jitsu career. Yeah. And so as a result of that, my focus started shifting more to our combat sports. And I went more in the direction of uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, judo, boxing, a little bit of shuai jiao. Um, that has been the bulk of my practice for the last, I don't even know by now, long, long time, probably 20 years or so. Yeah, and, and, and Tim himself also has a Kung Fu Sansu background. Is that how you met each other? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's how I met. I heard that he was a Kung Fu San Su guy and that he was teaching styles that I was interested in. I wanted to see his Bagua, I wanted to see his Shingi. Yeah. So I was like, ah, oh, that's great. It's a combination that seems uh, exactly what I want. Yeah, he's, so I, he's been on the podcast. I've had him uh, on the podcast in the past. And actually, he was also one of the reasons why I started branching off into Jiu Jitsu specifically. Um, and, and went down that road as well, which I, I still practice as well today, alongside my my Xingyi and Bagua, which are the styles that my, my core styles as well. But he was the he was the core reason that uh, that I decided to go and investigate that that as well as the ideas that um, it wasn't so easy to regularly throw the same training partners that you have a good relationship with. And I decided to go into a into a jiu-jitsu gym to see how it would be if I started trying to throw people that should know how to throw them so throw and uh, right. just to experience yeah. it. So it was a good experience all around. I mean, it's a growing experience yeah. and it's ongoing. It's ongoing. So, yeah. You know, jiu-jitsu is yeah, go ahead. in the sense that you take a little less damage to the body. I mean, mm. you still take damage like any combat sport you do, but uh, it's more at the peripheries, you know, you mess up an elbow, you mess up an ankle. You, it's not like striking arts where you get, you know, just the name of the game is getting it hit in the head, which is not really dialed in the mm. long term. Or or even stuff like some of the things that I like the most are Shuai Zhao and Judo. But getting thrown over and over and over again, start getting old after a while, even <laughs> if you know halfway decently are to fall. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I've seen people who are old as dirt and somehow they toss each other on dirt and they are fine and they pop right back up. And I'm like, okay, you are a unique human being because <laughs> most people it doesn't work that way. You know, you see a, a lot of old wrestlers who are really messed up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was just in Inner Mongolia. I went off to uh, Sunit Left Banner, which is really the middle of the grasslands. It's... Uh, it's not tourist it's just actually yep. you know where they live and i i went to, to visit my friend lavelle who's been studying uh mongolian wrestling there for the last couple of years he has a shui jiao background as well but he's been doing solely mongolian wrestling out in the grasslands the right way for the last couple of years and and you know mongolian wrestling is really interesting um because there's no weight limit there's no weight division so it's not as if uh, you're only going to fight people your size there's no time limit so that also uh, it's very much in line with their lifestyle too, um, but it changes a lot of things. But also, they fight anywhere and in any condition. So they'll just prepare an event. The, the second day, the second event, because we, I, I was, I went to two uh, Nadam uh, that they had. Um, it was the the grass, the area that they were wrestling on. There were stones there, and I I thought previously that you know the 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 so-called judges, you know, the overseers of the competition, you can call them judges, but they just kind of, uh, you know, you know, they it's a, it's a, it's a traditional kind of, uh, 
uh, thing where they're they're watching to if there's in case of a dispute or whatever. But they're just I mean the wrestlers know how to run the competition, right? So I thought they would walk the field and get off the big stones beforehand. No, they don't give a shit. They don't give a shit. These people are throwing each other on stones. Landing with a you know three hundred pound man on top of you on a stone, yeah, but no, no, they just carry on, and they were, they were also, I mean, classically, there's no age categories. Um, there were some old wrestlers there too that have been you know, doing this all the time for the majority of their life, and uh, they just carry on as you say. So I guess, you know, there there are there are um, definitely people that are like that, but I also think if that's the environment that you grow up grow up in and you're used to that, I think most people actually adapt to it in one way or the other. You know, so it's very interesting. Awesome. I'm puzzled by because I mean. What do you make of that? Because you see stuff like that happening, mm. and it's amazing. But then you see, like, if you go into the average judo school, you look at the old judokas, there's no one of them that walks straight. You know yeah. what I mean? They're yeah. all like, yeah, I mean, there's the occasional exception, but most of them are really literally bent out of shape. Right. I would say, though, that um, if you asked any one of them about their bent out of shapedness and their inability to walk straight, if if they would have been happy to walk straight and not be bent out of shape, but not have gone and done all those years of training and gotten all the enjoyment of that entire process. And I'm quite sure most of them would say they wouldn't change a damn thing, um, you know, for sure. But what do you think is the difference that allows some people to wrestle under those conditions you describe? You know, mm. these are people who throw each other in a field with rocks and they do it their whole life and they don't seem to suffer any damage from it versus a whole bunch of other people who love the game just as much, but they clearly take a lot of damage in the process to the point that their bodies are, yeah. are pretty heavily marked. By their activity sure I, I would you know the one thing is definitely the mongolians are built in a specific way genetically they're they're they've been doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years i think uh, their lifestyle which we could say is thousands of years old and this is for me the the funny thing about modern martial artists when they look at styles like uh um Mongolian wrestling or 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 even Shui Jiao and throwing arts even judo and they say oh um, This style was created by this guy like 150 years ago And it's because he liked leg sweeps and I'm like this doesn't make sense The reason why the art looks like that is because it's some development of their daily living so with the Mongolians right. they were nomadic people that herded animals, you know their art comes from their life. Their first thing they've got to, um, they're herding animals. And I don't know if you know much about nomadic lifestyles, but um, I was even there talking to some of the herders. Um, and they were saying things like, you know, we only keep one male that has like a horse, for example. They'll only keep one male that hasn't been castrated. You know, they'll, the rest of the horses, if there's males there, they'll castrate them. They'll keep the one male that they want to, you know, continue the line. And yeah. I and I asked them, why do you do yeah. this? And they said, it's well, because they will fight all the time if we don't do this. It's chaos with all our right. And it's the yeah. same with a sheep and it's the same with the cows. And I don't know if people realize this, but animals are not really fond of firstly being castrated. And horses, which are wild, yeah. are not very fond of being ridden. And in order to be yeah. able to live with these animals and you know, which they, they totally survive on these animals. I mean, there's, it's not as if they're growing vegetables and, and foraging the forest. Firstly, there is no forest. Secondly, there's nothing that grows out there in the grassland. You know, it's grass. Uh, in spring, yeah. in spring, there might be some wild onions that grow in certain places, but that's very limited and very few and far between. Their diet is totally reliant on their animals. And if their animals don't survive, they don't survive. So mm -hmm. when they're catching wild horses and taming them, it's an aspect of holding and controlling them. When, yeah. you're, when you've got to put a horse or a cow or even a sheep, but you've got to put them down and then castrate them, they're throwing these mm -hmm. animals. And I've seen it. I've seen them do leg trips yeah. on these animals. They'll hold the mane and they'll sweep the legs yeah. out. I've seen guys put a horse on their hip and throw it over their hip. I've seen the same with a... <laughs> yeah, I'm not joking. I've seen a full horse... A hip throw with a horse 
you know, so... Trip through a horse, a hips... that's taking it to a whole other level. No, you think, you know, you're, you're a 200-pound man. You think you're, you're heavy for one of these guys. No, these guys are throwing animals around, you know, so... And then you've got to uh, hold the thing down and castrate it. It's not as if they've got anesthetics and things like yeah. this. So, so their lifestyle has been like this for so long. It's been like this for so long that naturally their fighting style comes from this. And, and we could say similarly with a lot of the migrations of the original Japanese that went to Japan, they came out of this lifestyle too. So for me also the whole, you know, I've done a whole series about history of Shuaijiao trying to show certain aspects of these, but you know, there's so much misunderstanding and we're so simplistic in our views about martial arts today that we forget, you know, these are, these are a natural thing that evolved from conditions and environment of life we we right. we today choose martial arts not out of necessity not out of lifestyle but because we feel like it but back then mm -hmm. and and for people that live in these environments like in the in the grassland they still live in these environments this is just life so i think your in answer it's a long rounded answer to your question i think that their lifestyle for so many you could say thousands of years has adapted them in a way that these things, you know, both genetically, physically, they've evolved in a specific way. These things just don't affect them, say, for example, with a group of the same way as a, a group of people that haven't had that. So, you know, in some ways, mm -hmm. they're, they're hardier. I mean, right. I, I was watching them. I was eating with them. And look, my wife is from Inner Mongolia. But, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I spend most of the time she's from one of the main cities and uh, and uh, yeah. You know, when you go out to the grasslands, which I've been to before, but this time it was it was a little bit different. But, you know, when you see how they live, their their diet is literally milk, tea and meat three times a day, you know, and, and again, for me or you, that might be a problem if we had to try to live on that diet yeah. purely for the next three months. But for them, that's how they've survived and they thrive on that diet. So, you know lifestyle conditions people in a certain way and uh, i think that's really big a big part of it a very big part of it right that makes sense that that makes sense so it's like somebody the same person trying to do the same activity is not going to have the same results because right. you know there uh, there's almost a genetic history behind it that give you a predisposition that makes sense yeah for sure and i mean we see this in the olympics too which we overlook like uh, the kenyan runners or the ethiopian the people from highland areas that have uh, the ability to run endurance races that would seem superhuman to us but they've just evolved yeah. in, the, in this manner due to a lifestyle a li it's not as yeah. if they picked up running recently you know this again it comes back to the ignorance of a lot of martial artists today trying to look at things with a very narrow scope um mm -hmm. it's it's the same thing these people have these abilities because life pushed them in that direction and as you said they surfed that wave correctly and their bodies adapted you know over over thousands of Make years sense. so Makes sense. Makes you envious <laughs> that they have it, but uh, but yeah, it's fantastic. It's amazing when you witness it. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's really interesting. I saw a video of uh, just I think last year. Um, we we have sandstorms here in in, in China, um, and mm -hmm. they, they they originate from the desert areas up in uh, in Mongolia, etc. You know, and and of course when they hit Beijing, they're pretty bad. A couple were bad last year. To the point that we were advised to stay inside it's not the first time it happens every year but you can imagine what happens out there closer on the grassland areas you know um you're talking about last year people died they disappeared they got lost in the sandstorm yeah. you know and and i've seen people running a nadam a you know a wrestling competition and a sandstorm hits and these guys just keep wrestling they don't give a shit they just carry on wrestling in the middle of a sandstorm and i've seen video of this you know these people are not they are not what we think and there's no wonder that uh during uh, the yuan dynasty and uh and uh chingis's time these people were able to go anywhere everywhere endure anything and try to conquer just with a little bit of encouragement from a from a charismatic leader so yeah, yeah 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 that's cool yeah yeah you you know your your um i really enjoyed your book that you wrote um on the warrior's path um mm -hmm. when was it i think it was published in 2008 right 
Yeah, it actually that's as, as a long journey, that book, because originally I wrote a version of that when I was super young in mm. Italy. That was back in 96. Then I finally learned how to write in English decently enough. So an early, like a first edition was published in 2003. And then a second edition that included, I think, a couple of extra chapters was published in 2008. Okay. So that one has been through the ringer, has been through a lot of versions. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was, there was so much that I enjoyed in terms of your, your perspectives on many things. But I want to ask you, since the time that you've published this and going on your path. Oh, also, I wanted to congratulate you. We were talking about judo and I forgot to congratulate you because I know recently you got your black belt in judo so congratulations oh, yeah. <laughs> on that thank you thank you but would you say that any of your perspectives or ideas that you had in this book have changed or or have morphed in in the time since you've published it i mean definitely the italian version yes of course there was something uh, i think the core ideas are there but there was a bit of a more little bit more naive approach to martial arts mm. I think over time, experiencing more, just I understood it all a lot better. But, uh, you know, the, the basic insights haven't changed. I think it's like specific example or the tone that I would use or how much I would accent one concept over another. So the balance has changed. But the, the key insight, I don't think they have. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of the things and a lot of your your uh, pers perspectives here are universal, um, definitely for martial arts. But like we say, um, in my experience, at least martial arts is a is a lens through which you can you know view life in many ways. So you know maybe I'm biased because I'm a martial artist and a dancer will say no, hang on, dancing is the same thing. But I think they all kind of, of they kind of shed light on a very similar topic of our existence here and how to deal with it. So. Um, I mean, I think that martial art, uh, a way in which martial arts are different from other things is that martial arts deal with conflict in such an unambiguous and objective way. Mm. And so much of life is about dealing with conflict. And I, I don't mean conflict even with other people. I mean, even just conflict between your desires and reality. You're right. Conflict between... Uh, you know, our, who we want to be, uh, who, our own weaknesses, conflict. You know, there are conflict that we experience constantly before you even move to the level of conflict with others. Yeah. So we are very familiar. I mean, if you think about all the stories of every other movie you've ever watched, every book, every everything, there's never a tale that's about things who are good and they stayed good and they ended well. You know, yeah. it's like usually there's something happens that creates a conflict that the lead character in the story need to grapple with. Yeah, that's what all our stories are about, right? Because that's what all our lives are about. There's a constant, never-ending supplies of conflict delivered to us by daily life. So having a practice in which conflict comes to the forefront, where it's there's a an extremely clear way to quote unquote win the conflict and lose the conflict there's a i think it it appeals to something within us because we recognize the same pattern that we go through all the time anyway yeah that's very true yeah that's very true so and, and also i mean there's a lot of discussion today about the origins of martial arts, particularly with martial studies groups looking into, you know, what what was it? Was it a was it purely a combat uh, endeavor in its origination? And then or was it a religious slash cultural slash some other aspect to it? Uh, uh, and and it just had martial elements in it you know there's 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 always this um, circular discussion and particularly in today's uh, research fields regarding this but you know I, I i personally think that the one the one factor or the one uh, trait that uh, defines martial art in comparison to all the others is in fact that you know physical combat physical conflict uh, that realm exists for the most part, I, again, I don't want to paint all martial arts the same because there are indeed differences in that, pers you know, that basic uh, launch pad with different arts. Some styles you can see where, where, you know, their creation was more in the lines of maybe ritual or things like that. And they just, oh. but, but, you know, for the majority of the ones that we consider martial arts, 
I would say that the defining factor that they launched themselves off of was was conflict combat and how to deal with that you know human you know combat in differing forms and and it just so happened to be that aspects of spirituality culture uh, these other aspects were just much more people were more soaked in them in their daily life and and outlook on the world i mean they were looking at the world if you look at china you see it if you go back one or two hundred years that people's outlook on the world was they were looking at the world through the lens of their respective uh, cultural or religious or philosophical beliefs everything was gauged in that so why wouldn't martial arts be seen even as a martial endeavor seen through the lens of these these things and i think we have a tough time understanding that today because we have changed so much you know um right we don't see the world in the same way as they did we see it in a in a much more black and white concrete there's a universal scientific understanding of what life is and the world is and then everything else is kind of an add-on that is not really in the center but more on the periphery of our existence whereas back then um it wasn't like that so it's i think it's a very tough thing to do to try to say either or with this with this discussion just simply because we've changed so much as human beings you know 100% i agree with you so i think that's uh, that's very much where it's at and that's where i think to me martial art get interesting because it's um I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you and I are have been training forever. We like this stuff, so we can nerd out about the details of martial arts from here or two forever. Mm. But at the same time, the reality is that, you know, you can only talk so many times about the perfect throw or a great armbar. The st- where it gets really interesting is where it's on the... Um, uh, it's how it translates to daily life yeah. is how does the, like why even spend all this time if it's just purely about the action itself do we care that much about uh, learning how to throw the perfect punch or is it because also beside feeling good at the moment it also inform some of the rest of your daily life so it gives you some keys that help you in your day-to-day interactions with other people, with relationship with yourself, with your, you know. And that, to me, is where where the whole thing gets really interesting. Because otherwise, after a while, even martial arts get boring. It's like, okay, can we stop talking only technique 24 hours a day? Technique is great. I love it. But there's a point where there's more to life than this. Mm. Yeah, uh, you see it even today with things that we practice that are totally irrelevant. I mean, I practice with a big spear every day. Uh, the, 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 the big spear practice I'm doing is um, I'm trying to refine and perfect my body mechanics and my technique. But to what end? It's not as if I'm going to go out there and be using a pike. Uh, in fact, I'll probably never be in a situation that I have to use a spear in a in a life or death or daily situation at all. But why do we do it? Well, you know, I can't answer that in one sentence and I probably don't, I I probably don't understand it from a cognitive point of view completely. It's probably something much more than that, but Hey, there is so much value to it in other aspects in terms of the endeavor itself, in terms of the uh, spiritual and mental side of it. And, and, you know, it's also, it's kind of like a vitamin, you know, the, the, the action of doing it just makes me healthier all around. I, I can't explain it, but I feel better after training, you know, so, yeah, you know, these, absolutely. these are important things that if we just look at the practicality only, I'm not saying don't throw practicality out because that is another sure. problem on its own. But if we only look at that, we can cut off so many things from our practice but then again we can also cut off practice in totality because how many of us are actually going to go out there and fight how many of us live yep. in in societies that are so safe today that the reality or the, the the chance of having a serious conflict is slim to none um yep. and then what do you do do you say okay well in that case i don't practice martial arts but then you realize it's more it's more than that it's definitely more than that so I agree a hundred percent. It's both. You, it, and I think you, you know, I know exactly where you're going, where we say, yeah, at the same time, we shouldn't forget about practicality because I get really t- 
tired of the overly romanticized approach to right. martial arts, but I just get just as tired by the overly practical approach to martial arts. Yeah. I feel that both sides miss the boat there by insisting that um, approaching martial arts in one way and one way only. Because I think that's the beauty of it. It's yeah. beautiful because the practicality of it uh, is uh, forces you not to get lost in abstract speculation or philosophies that are not grounded in day-to-day -day life. But they force you to deal with a reality that, no, is not just all in your head. There is an objective reality out there that you have to come to terms with. Yeah. And at the same time, the ability to take what we learn on the mat and apply to much more than what you learn on the mat. Apply to all of the rest of your life, how you raise kids, how you interact in your marriage, how you deal with your friends, how you... Yeah. That's also fantastically meaningful. And to have to choose one side or another, like we turn it into kind of this nerdy philosophical game or into a purely, the only thing that matters is uh, fighting effectiveness, I think we're missing the boat. They are both good. Yeah, I completely agree. And even the cultural side of things. I mean, we're human beings. We are complicated creatures that seem to to try to look for meaning or to inject meaning into things that not necessarily portray those meanings or don't might even not include those meanings. But we we seek them out and we create them we create narratives i mean some people might get angry with what i'm saying because they'll say oh no no this is the divine truth but we, you know as human beings this is what we look for in all our endeavors we we look for this deeper meaning whether it be spiritual religious whatever you want to call it in in life and and that's a big part of of martial arts it's included in the cultural side of it the philosophical side of it the the spiritual side of it now again i don't want to talk about mystical energy and things like that because i think those people have kind of missed the the point but you know these aspects you can see it in our earliest renditions as human beings and the things that we decided to paint about in caves you know we try to look for meaning in in everything we do and i think that's important it's it's a if you strip that out of martial arts as well which is back to your point about just focusing on technique I think that even if you're not aware of it, you you subconsciously know that something is missing, you know, and uh, you look for that elsewhere. Then you look for that deeper meaning elsewhere, which might be why a lot of people quit martial arts in after some years. So, yeah, absolutely. I I think we have the same approach to it. Yeah, your your um your experience with kung fu sansu. I don't know what the what the the situation is with that style is it still practiced in the states i mean are there still schools teaching it i mean it's practice so there are school teaching it's kind of like like most anything else that's not combat sports it's kind of dying in terms of uh, popularity mm. because you know you see you know i don't know correct me if i'm wrong but my perception right now of where i'm at in terms of what i see around me in us is that i see a lot of taekwondo for kids primarily mm. you know there's the whole nobody has cornered a kid market as much as taekwondo so there's those guys do very well because they cater through the five through 15 years old kind of thing there's um, a ton of combat sports, you know, primarily Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Muay Thai, with boxing gym have their own tradition. Judo is a little weird, but it survives, like it has always survived for a very, very long time. It has its own thing, but it's somewhat anachronistic in some way in mm. terms of, I think they are trying to bring it back and reunite it in some way with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, some people, and I think that's a good idea. I think so too. Uh, I think that's a good approach to give it new life. Mm. Um, other than that, you know, then you start going into the more esoteric stuff because you see, do people practice uh, Filipino stuff? Yes, there is its own niche. It's a niche, you know, you don't exactly see schools in every corner, but mm. it exists as a niche. Um, and then beyond that, you know, there's a lot of the Chinese arts have been dramatically diminishing compared to what they were in the 70s or 80s mm. so and a lot of the uh, more other traditional styles have been dramatically declining in terms of numbers so it's um i'm not sure where they are at in terms of their future 
because uh, like if you look at most Confucian schools today that have gone, never mind the fact that there are a fraction of what it used to be just 20 years ago, but most of the people like 20 years ago, you would see people who were young, in shape, tough, they were athletes, mm. right? Most of the people you see practicing today are either older because they fell in love with it when they were 20 and they, you know, now they are not, but they keep practicing it. Right. Or uh, or they are people who are not your typical kind of young, tough, strong, athletic person because those people go into combat sports. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, it's interesting. We are in an interesting time right now, particularly because of the, the wave that and the well, the revolution of MMA in terms of not only approach and mentality, but also in terms of opportunity. I think people miss miss that point quite, quite uh, extensively. The, the opportunities that people have within MMA far exceed opportunities outside in other combat sports and particularly with uh, martial arts that aren't geared towards competition or lack any competitive format. The opportunities within MMA are like head, shoulders and torso above almost all of them. I mean, so that yeah. that's a very important factor with regards to what people decide to to go. What's funny for me, though, is the people that get into MMA that have no inclination to to compete or to yeah. fight and and I kind of think, well, yes, there's technical benefit to to that, but I kind of don't understand, or maybe they don't even understand why they're doing it. I think there's a perception that combat sports are real fighting, so that mm. if you want effectiveness, you need to do combat sports. And there's a truth to that, and there's also a mistake there. Yeah. In the sense that on one end, of course, if you don't train with a resisting opponent ever, then you're deluding yourself. You know, of course, you need to train with adrenaline, with resistance, with sense of distance, with somebody who is trying with every fiber of their being not to let you do a certain technique. You know, you need that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. At the same time, I think as much as that's true, there's a, there's a misunderstanding there that just because you can become skilled at a combat sport, that is going to translate to other contexts. And it translates to some degree. But, like, I give you an example. I can't tell you how many videos I've seen of people who clearly look like they are decently trained, they are in a street fight, they level change, they shoot under the other person's punches, they take them down, they get to mount. You know, if this was a fight in the cage, they are dominating. They are doing fantastically. Mm. But they forget that it's not a fight in the cage, and then the other guy's girlfriend walks up and she kick them in the head and knock them out. <laughs> and <they're> like, <laughs> you know... <laughs> context is important what you the way you are fighting you are fighting like you are fighting a combat sport is mm. good it has a lot of elements that are helpful but no this is not a combat sport scenario you cannot do the same things yeah. so i feel that sometimes people because they have been tricked by so many traditional style that argued we have the best ways to train will make you amazing and then you throw them into a cage and they look awful right then they think like there's nothing worth saving in all that stuff. That was all bullshit. And the only good stuff are the combat sports. Right. And I feel like uh, I would tweak that balance a little. I think that while maybe if you are interested in the effectiveness, definitely spending a lot of time co doing combat sports is important. I don't think doing only combat sports is the way to do it. You know, I think there's something to be said. Like, for example, in Kung Fu Sun Tzu, there are things where you deal with the idea of awareness of multiple opponents and what do you do to make sure to put one body between you and the next attacker and how you try to finish a fight. Not You're not planning on a 15-minute fight with somebody of your same uh, height, weight, and experience. You're planning in a five-seconds fight with somebody who may be bigger and stronger than you. And so who hits first in the most vulnerable spot may count more. It's probably the only thing that gives you a chance to survive that encounter that you would definitely lose if you are playing fairly in even rules with the referee. Yeah. And, and I think those things are important to keep in mind. You know, I, I feel that... There has been too much of throwing throwing away the baby with the dirty bathwater kind of thing. And 
Uh, while I'm a big, big fan of practicing combat sports, I feel that there's a lot missed when we practice only combat sports. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think it's, uh, it's a perspective that people seem to miss. You know, you mentioned something quite interesting. I've got a friend who's uh, he's a traditional martial artist, someone I look up to, someone who's very good at what he does. And he specializes, and he has for most of his life, in in dart throwing and he's ridiculously good at dart throwing i mean he can throw anything at you mm -hmm. um right and uh he was telling me about an altercation not an altercation physically but uh you know some something that came up with another mma group in his area um you know a little bit of uh, heated discussion and some insulting that was coming from from some sides of them to the point that he you know, he responded and uh, one of the heads of that uh, MMA group uh, said, OK, well, you'll, you know, we'll we'll have a challenge fight in the cage. Why don't you come and fight? And my friend said to me, you know, I don't the, the mentality is 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 troubling because he says, you know, the reality is I'll throw my darts before the guy even gets up out of his chair. Now, look, I know I understand that. You can't do that in modern civil society, but it, sure. it is an important mentality to understand what you're dealing with, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, it's, and I think that is part of the reason why some things, and it's, you know, partially the fault of, again, the safety of modern society. But I do think there is value to understanding these things because we've seen how quickly things can crumble. Uh, you were in, you're in the mm -hmm. States last year when, when things were a little bit out of hand. Uh, society that you think works in a certain way crumbles and suddenly you're in a dangerous situation that you know changes i grew up in south africa so things happen very quickly there that uh, are completely out of the realm of legality you know so you have to know how to deal with these things and it's important it's it's imp definitely definitely and i think that's where I do believe that like the popularity of MMA has uh, been a super necessary to correct a lot of the um, smoke and mirrors and mythology and just flat out bullshit mm. that surrounded the practice of martial arts in the past. Yeah. But I also feel that it has gone maybe too far the other route, where I feel that there are arts that are, you can benefit a lot from studying certain arts to this day, maybe modified, that's fine but still not to throw away the whole thing. Right. And like, for example, to me, the ideal balance is uh, you study combat sports, which means both the throwing part, the ground game, and, um, and the striking. Yeah. So, you know, whether that means MMA or whether it's because you're doing multiple things, boxing, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, mm -hmm. or shuai jai, or judo, or whatever that may be, that's your choice. But those are the options, mm -hmm. right? you train uh, something that teach you about uh, about the kind of weapons that you can deal with in reality so you're doing sorry by the way my dog is going crazy no in the problem. background and make sort of weird noises maybe he has something to add to the conversation right exactly <laughs> or maybe i just need to throw him mongolian style and pass straight spot and that's the now, so you have, uh, you know, something like a screamer where you learn how to deal with sticks, and blades and things like that. Yeah. Um, you train, uh, to me, something like Tai Chi, both in terms of an understanding of body mechanics, as meditative practice, as uh, it has a different training methodology than most other things. And whether it's purely because it feels good or because you think you can derive something in terms of your other skills... I find it a great practice. Mm. Probably a more self-defense oriented style, something that's not designed for sports, it's not designed for an even fair fight, it's designed to what can I do in a situation that may not smile upon me if we were strapping on gloves and fighting evenly. Yeah. How can somebody who's, uh, what can somebody who's smaller and weaker and all those other negative aspects, what can they do in that situation? Because just saying that they should be stronger, well, thanks, but you know, that person is not. So is that your last answer that you're gonna give them? <laughs> what can you give them to deal with? Uh, so all those things to me are like, right there you're looking at multiple arts. And and that to me is what, I mean, again, you know, nobody, maybe some people don't have the time. They don't care that much for that and that's mm, fine. Mm. But to me, a complete martial art practice including includes all those things. I agree. 
And I think if the, if we look at a lot of the classical styles, they actually incorporate little elements of those in bits and pieces, some to larger degrees than other. I mean, uh, for example, Xing Yichuan, my, my core system, has, has bare hand and weapon, short weapon, long weapon, and concealed weapons, you know. Um, and and mm -hmm. I think as your conclusion, because it's a realistic one, was one that was a little bit more obvious back in the day because reality was a lot more in your face back then, right? So um, th that was probably where it came. But I did, you know, pick up the, the side of jujitsu because of uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, influence from listening to Tim Cartmel way back in the day and, and other people like reading um, a, a really great book was uh, I think it's called Mastering Jiu Jitsu by Dan O'Hara and Henzo Gracie you know it's yeah. And, and I, you know, obviously the, the ground aspect is something that is not so prominent in, um, in Xingyi and Bagua, you know, once you go to the ground, not how to get there. I mean, Bagua has takedowns, but how, what you, what happens when you go there yourself, um, or you take somebody down there and they know what they're doing. So you, you, I, I filled that hole as well. So, I mean, that was, a. Uh, something that I found was lacking and I decided, okay, well, that needs filling and not to be in terms of competition. I didn't do it for, for that, for that purpose, but, but just as you've mentioned for those, those reasons. And I think it's a healthy approach, what you've just mentioned, a very healthy approach. Of course, there's only so much time in the day. So, you know, people may have other priorities too. And there's, but I do think that in an ideal world, you know, if you have a great combat sport practice, Figure out a way to incorporate 10%, 20% of your practice in a direction that goes in a different way. Mm. If you do care about effectiveness, do look at what more self-defense oriented styles focus on. Right. Now, clearly self-defense oriented style have the drawback that you cannot practice realistically. You cannot be sparring, kicking people in the balls and finger jabbing them in the eyes, you know? <laughs> but at the same time, figure out what you can do to add to your combat sport practice that also remind you that those things are real, that they are part of what makes a martial art. And we're, we're lucky today, comparatively to our ancestors in, in these arts, um, in that we have a lot of modern equipment and materials that actually enable us to be able to practice some of those things not fully but at least to a certain degree mm -hmm. in in comparison to what they couldn't in the past safely because of modern equipment modern materials uh, there's a lot of opportunity and i think people need to keep their mind open as to how to implement those to help those those uh, those practices and i mean i i've developed certain things that fit into my uh, shingi practice that my teacher didn't have and actually he he fully, you know, uh, what's the word? He approves of the, the equipment and the methods because of, they weren't around when he was young, you know, and he saw what I did. I mean, yeah. uh, I won't get into much detail about it, but he told me, you know, write all that down and, and, and release it at some point because it's a very good training tool, sure. etc. You know, and, and I think this is something that we can do as, as Marshall, as long as you're, you're open to it. And this comes back to that idea of people being closed in a box that think, oh, no, but it wasn't this way before so don't add it you know and that's a silly mentality it holds things back so. yeah i agree i think it's like uh, you can always add you know the problem sometimes is that you decide to get rid of the wrong stuff yes their stuff that was great maybe you shouldn't lose but adding stuff what's the problem with adding stuff yeah. you can always decide uh, i don't really want to focus on that that's fine but uh, learning how to having more options is never a bad thing. So. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that because I don't know, within the Chinese martial arts community, there seems to be this taboo, this stigma against non-Chinese arts. You know, if you did, for example, yeah. you did Xingyi and you then decided to do Judo. I mean, the initial and people subconsciously have it, even if they're not aware of it within Chinese martial arts, but they'll be like, hang on a minute. Why are you doing Japanese martial arts? You know, uh, and, and, and you're doing it, let's say, for example, because you want to improve certain aspects of throwing and things like that. But their immediate knee jerk reaction is judo is Japanese. It's not Chinese martial arts. Therefore, it's bad for you to do. But those same people, if you told them, you know, I've picked up Shui Jiao, they'll be like, oh, great. That's great. You should do that because it's, you know, going to help you with your throwing. And I look at these people and I'm like, do you realize how silly you sound? You know, I mean, right. and they don't, unfortunately, a lot of these people don't realize how silly they sound, you know, so. Right. 
Uh, and again, exactly. as as and I, yeah, go ahead, the, go ahead. The nationalism is never a good thing when it comes to martial arts. Yeah. The um, the desire to keep things overly stuck in the way things were done in the past is never a good thing. I think it's like there are training methods that should not be abandoned. But yeah, to be blind to this kind of stuff is just, that's craziness. You know, it's like, that's almost like, uh, what is it? This is like 50 years ago you had Bruce Lee arguing, uh, doesn't matter whether it's a Korean uh, technique or a Japanese technique or a Chinese technique or an anything technique. You're a human being, first and foremost, and that's ultimately the only thing that counts. Yeah, well, there's also a saying here, which is kind of uh, political in nature, but it's a good saying in any case. It says it doesn't matter if it's a black cat or a white cat as long as it catches a mouse, you know, so. Yeah, exactly. And that, uh, I like that very practical approach to things, you know. Yeah, exactly. I feel, uh, it's at the end of the day if it works use it yeah. you know why not yeah. uh, that's what counts and i think that's one aspect in chinese culture is the nationalism but the other one is also the heavy confucianism that has given this uh, somewhat hostility to innovation mm. where it's like things have to be done the way of the ancestors things have to be done the way they've always been done who the hell are you to innovate to add to create something um, I think it gives a bit of an overly conservative vibe sometimes right. to um, to the discussions. My filial piety. I mean, that's the un yep. unfortunate part of it when it's taken to an extreme. Well, yep. you know, uh, it becomes a problem. And unfortunately, Confucianism is very much based on that. So it has been part of the problem. But they've also found some creative ways to deal with that problem Um uh, and I would say it's not it's not a productive or positive way. They would then simply take something that was inherently not theirs, or they would take something that is inherently not old. Uh, they would absorb it and apply it, but just simply rewrite the reality of where it came from, how it came from there, with a fake uh, with a fake uh, story. And I mean, this is unfortunately part of the the rationale why I decided to make this um, Shui Zhao history series was because. Over the years, the rhetoric has become taken as gospel truth, but the truth of it is a far more, well, open-minded. Let's call it that. I mean, the 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 grassland people, the steppe people, the Manchus, the Mongols that came from those different cultures, they were excellent wrestlers. And this is their art that was adapted and became a thing that became popular here in much more recent time among the general population in the north i wouldn't say in the south but and and, and that's good why why not why not uh, why not admit where the history comes from instead of trying to you know rewrite the history and create a false narrative and take the 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 truth of the origins away from the culture and the people that that it came from so you know that's that's part of uh, and we we see this with chinese martial arts too you know um you, these fantastic histories with magical sages or military generals and they created all the but it's not the truth and it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be the truth you know we can we can look at it for what it is and still appreciate it and still and still practice it and and uh you know develop from it you know they did this with judo too i mean if you looked at the rhetoric out of china and the in the last hundred years, they'll say things like, oh, it came from China. Why Why would you think that the Japanese were never throwing each other? You know, why would you... Wh right. You, you know, why would you think that people that come from the cultures that I mentioned of nomadic horse breeders did not know how to hold, mm -hmm. control, and put things on the floor? Of course they did. You didn't need to teach them that. Right. You know, so... Yep, yep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I think it's, uh, I mean, when you look at like, yeah, the difference between history and reality in martial arts is ridiculous. I mean, the number of uh, complete crazy myths surrounding martial arts is just not right for me. Mm. It's, uh, I mean, some of it is enjoyable. Mm, like the, some of the stories are, they are so cool. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, not if you take them as literal history, That then we got a problem. Yeah, yeah. If I may, I, I mean, you, you did some Shingi and some Bagua with, uh, with, with Tim Cartnell, I assume, correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. How did you find your practice of those arts? I mean, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> I like them a lot, but um, 
I don't know. Like I, I like a lot the, the ideas they give me, some ways in, of moving my body. Mm. I don't, there are even specific techniques that I like a lot that I would use still to this day. Mm. Mm. I still am slightly confused in the sense that I wasn't fully sure I understood the process. Okay. Like, what exactly are we trying to achieve? Or is it in terms of effectiveness, how we are going about it? Where am I into this process? Am I really fully understanding it or am I just barely scratching the surface? Mm. Sometimes it was uh, a little harder to understand than uh, that's. I, I think that's also why people like combat sports because it's very clear where you're at. Yeah. People understand very clearly where you are at on the journey. Mm, with a lot of Bagua and Shingi, I like them so much, really a lot. And I still, I was less than clear about the whole full process. Like, where does it lead? Uh, how good you can expect to get based on this stuff? What you can and cannot use and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's again... I, I mean, this is my experience, and Shingi was my core, Bagua is my auxiliary art, just like my teacher. Um, I found over the years and years now of doing it, I mean, exceeding decades, so, so it's it's not a short-term process. I think that's the problem with, with it, and it's very, I, I might, I mean, I might have an understanding today in 10 years would say, oh, well... You know that still wasn't wasn't uh, a full understanding uh, in ten years from now. So I think that is part of the issue with these arts is that, you know, the understanding takes a long period of time. But I will say this, and it's something that uh, that I think is quite pertinent today. I mean, my teacher he he did Xingyi as his core art. That was his art that he learned first. He learned it. Um, I would say first, but. Uh, not first in terms of his first martial art because his teacher, you know, Shingi is generally not taught to kids. Uh, these arts aren't taught to young people. They're not taught to people that have zero martial ability in general. They were always taught to somebody that had some basic basic foundation first. Shingi is the same. So my teacher, as a youngster, when he first started training with his teacher, was doing what you'd consider external Shaolin. I don't like the term internal and external, but just for... For simplicity's sake and then when he got to a certain age his teacher said okay good now you'll start doing xingyi and that was his core art for a very long time i mean he had mastered the art finished basically learning that with his xingyi his main teacher Zhao Zhong, before he started learning bagua with with li Ziming. and and he was much older and i think that my experience with these arts and i followed his path as well i didn't do any bagua before doing Xingyi very extensively and developing the mechanics and all of that. I find that Bagua is an art like that. I mean, Bagua, there's a few different approaches to it, but I find that all of them share this in, in that regard, that they are not really suitable to people that have a low basic physical and martial ability and understanding. It's very hard to understand what's going on there um, unless you have some background so i find today because people find the exoticism of bagua appealing that they want to go directly into it and that this applies to any arts that are somewhat in that realm they try to go into it without a basic foundation first and that's where where it becomes problematic this is my experience with bagua at least and i've seen people that have come to my teacher specifically to learn bagua with no background and he'll be trying to tell them look you should try do something else but he's not going to he's not going to you know say no and uh you want to try it go ahead and try it but i've seen the results after a couple of years of basically no engine you know i mean they might be moving their arms in the correct way but there's no engine there and there's some lack of substance there that 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 occurs so this has been my my perspective of of those arts up until now and uh and uh, Bagua specifically is an art that can be complicated and misunderstood if you have a very, if you don't have a background in, in certain things. I'm not saying this is your case at all. I'm not talking about you. But, uh, but I, find, sure. I find that sure. this is something that happens. And because of that, you get a lot of fluff and then people come out and they're like, oh, this art is useless or they quit or something like that. But it's, it's not really the case. Right, so. right, right, right. No, that makes perfect sense. And I mean, even the history of Bagua goes in that direction because it wasn't an art that 
pretty much anybody who started back in the day was already well accomplished in other arts. Yes. He wasn't a, a beginner art. So I get it. That makes sense. Yeah, I think Dong Hai Chuan had a very interesting mindset. I think what he was doing was not trying to teach a specific art as a whole. I think he was he was offering certain tools to people that have already had skills and those tools weren't set. You chose the tools that suited your, your already developed skills and you wouldn't use the other tools. So he might have a set of tools, um, but you'd only take six of the 10 for you. And another guy who had different right. ability, he took another five, some overlapping, some mm -hmm. different to yours. And that's that was fine in Dong Hai Chuan's mind. It was like, well, that's that's you taking the the parts that are are useful to you, and that's good. Developing on that from that, but you know, then what happened from there was people try to hand down those tools to people as is in a box without them having any ability before, and then it just became, you know, uh, problematic. So definitely, definitely. No, that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Um, I feel in some way like one issue that I've always had with Chinese martial arts and that just may be the way my brain works but I feel that I need to have a structure mm. I need to have almost a syllabus you know where I have a very clear understanding of step one step two step three what's expected at each stage mm. what can I look forward to what am I missing that kind of thing I find that to help my understanding of uh of an art that helps me learn a whole lot better. Mm. And I never found it in an incredible clear way when it came to Chinese martial arts. Yeah. So, I mean, for that matter, I don't find it that clear even in jujitsu, where it's kind of like one day they show you one thing, one day they show you another, and you are supposed to have seen all this stuff by the time you hit a certain belt, but half of the time you haven't. So I'm like, okay, you know, it, it's not like a unique thing to Chinese martial arts. But I definitely struggled this uh, little bit in Chinese martial arts. I felt that there was this, uh, well, wh one day will all make sense. And I'm like, can't I see the steps to when it will all make sense? And can you just break down where we are at on this process mm. so that I understand exactly what's expected of me, where we're going, what I already have, what I'm missing, that kind of thing? That's true. But I think we ha that was actually more common in, in older arts in general, not just Chinese. I think the, one of the, the right. that what you just said was one of the reasons why Jigoro Kano systemized judo. Um, yeah. So yeah, and it, 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 it's effective. It's actually a very intelligent thing, and you can see it in jujitsu with somebody like John Danaher. Like, all right, well, let's systemize this, yep. and it's an it's a exactly. it's a effective, you know, method of teaching and making sure that people develop in a certain direction. And I think uh, you know, I mean, for for the most part, my teacher did the same thing with his arts. He he systemized them in a logical progression, which he didn't have the benefit of from his teacher. So, you know, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I agree with you. I think it's something that uh, particularly in today's day and age is important. Um, especially, look, if we go back again, my teacher's time, his teacher's time, they would simply be living and spending their days with their teacher for the majority of their lives. So you know you're gonna be training with this guy for 25 years every single day eventually you'll have everything it's just a man right, right there's no there's no need to to clarify this my teacher you know his his life was exactly that he would get on his bicycle he would ride his bicycle in the early even up until when, even after he was married ride his bicycle to his right. teacher's home before the sun comes up train for three hours two hours before work and go directly to work you know finish work, ride the bicycle back to his teacher's place, train for an hour or so and go home. This was their life. There was no Netflix. There was no TV. There was this, this was their life. Go home, sure. eat, spend some time with the family, rinse, repeat the next day. But people don't have that today. So they're kind of like, all right, well, I go to training on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays um, from 6.30 to 8. And I need to know, you know, step one, step two, step three. So I think modern society has created a need for this kind of structural, call it a roadmap within your progression. And I think Jigoro Kano was a genius. I keep saying this because I think he was one of the, one of the true martial geniuses of the modern age because he identified many of these aspects with, that we spoke about today and effectively created systems to deal with them from 
a structure from resisting uh, and regular training with a with an opponent to the idea of competition or although his idea of competition is different to what it's morphed into but the initial seed of his idea is correct so you know i'm, I'm agreeing with him right. And I think what's funny too is that while you're a hundred percent right about the canon thing, is like even if you look at the way most judo is taught, mm. it also has no system. In the sense that yeah, you only have like sixty some techniques, and uh, but half of the time, and I'm not general, you know, I'm sure some schools do it very differently, but in most schools they show you a technique one day, a technique another do these drills uh, that may or may not translate to your actual randori a bunch of times and then do randori and everybody's like super tense and <laughs> kind of using one of strength because nobody likes to get thrown really hard and they're like i don't know it feels like there are major like the whole process could be made so much smoother and easier mm. like i feel like you break down the throws, you know, the throws, there are only four main divisions, right? There are foot sweeps, sacrifice throws, uh, hand techniques, and hip throws. Mm. Each one, if you re, I mean, there are esoteric throws, there are variations on what's essentially the same throw, but if you look at the stuff that you commonly are going to use, it's maybe seven or eight throws in each one. Mm. So you're looking at probably no more than actual 30 techniques. Um, out of those 30 techniques, if you start drilling them, you know, you only have like maybe seven foot sweeps and you drill those to death. You're going to be pretty good at foot sweeps relatively quickly. Yeah. You start drilling entries into hip throws. There are only so many. There aren't 500. There are only a few. You drill those to death. And then you start working a randori that is not you go from semi-useless drills where you do the Zuchikomi against a static opponent to oppose no resistance, but... Maybe you just dance around with each other and you drill entries. You're doing randori purely entries. Mm. So you get an entry, don't throw. So people are relaxed. They are open. They pay attention because they know they are not going to get slammed on their head. And so it's like, okay, we're drilling entries. That's cool. But entries is half of judo, right? It's like if you have a good entry, then finishing the throw, you're not that far off. Right. But in the meantime, you got people to relax, and now they are more open. And then you start throwing each other, but maybe you only do foot sweeps and sacrifice throws, where the odds are much better that it's not going to be a super high elevation throw that's slamming on your head, mm. maybe except a sotari or something like that. And, and people are going to do that. And then you can add, the, I don't know, to me, even judo, there's a way where you can make the whole process so much easier to learn and absorb right. than what I typically see. And again, I'm generalizing. I'm sure there are some fantastic judo schools that do this down to a science. But from what I've seen, I'm like, man, like a lot... Like one time I was uh, maybe six or seven years into my judo. I watch a judo DVD and somebody showed a technique where there was a footwork movement that was so basic and so perfect. Mm. I was like, this should be taught on day one. This is like the basic of foot, judo footwork. This is a genius turning what's a neutral situation in one where you have an advantage, moving one foot. And I was like, why did nobody ever show me this stuff before? Yeah. Like, come on, man. It's like this idea that eventually you're going to see it all. It's like, no, why don't we structure it so yeah. that there's a clear progress where people can learn <laughs> basics and then go from there. Have you written and any of these ideas of... down? I mean, in terms of uh, a progressive idea that you would you would implement had you been teaching or if you should teach? I think I'm working a little bit with my lady because she, I mean, she trains professionally in MMA, but like I, I'm trying to help her kind of expand on her judo. She has some judo basics, but I'm kind of tired trying to help her to speed up the process of getting better at it. Good. And uh, she likes it a lot. She feels that she's learning it way faster and is making sense. I don't know if it's just because us and we click and she understand me better and the way I express things. I don't know that I've necessarily figured out a way that's better for everybody, but for me and for people that I interact with, it seems to work better. I think it is but, a logical progressive idea. Look, I'll, I mean, I'll give you an example from Xingyi with my teacher's methods. And uh, we have yeah. a very similar thing. We have set techniques, as you know, 
which exist in mm-hmm. Xingyi. So uh, you have set techniques and set methods and set practices for those. And then if you go to the other extreme, you'd have sparring, right? But but you need a bridge mm-hmm. in between and you need a progressive bridge. So the set techniques in terms of Xingyi, Xingyi is, is somewhat genius in this regard because it's... Um, it's line drills, but the way it's been broken up is it's body mechanics and vectors of force based with the initial methods that yep. you learn. And then those are applied to specific techniques. So it's progressive in that sense that once you've got the mechanics and the body uh, mechanics and the way of moving down, then you'll find how those are going to be applied to specific techniques, which are combat applied techniques, right? So it goes in that way. Right. But with regards to partner work, we also have that similar thing that we go from set partner drills with specific techniques where both of us know what we're doing there's a there's a there's a uh, what's the word a instigator and a responder or an initiator and a responder and each person knows what he's doing even if it's just one technique each and it starts from that first you know and then maybe it'll go to two techniques and then it'll go to three techniques and then it'll go to stepping with techniques and and i think these are important steps before you go to to sparring because you're starting to develop habits. But then even when we spar, I mean, I'll have times with my own training that even if the opponent is doing whatever he wants to do, I limit myself. I'll say today, I'm just going to work on this specific technique and find a way to get it to work in the sparring session. And it's free sparring, but I wouldn't be able to do that without going through those previous steps, you know, and I think it's important. And I think that's the system idea that you're kind of referring referring to to a degree. So I guess we can, uh, well, we're across the globe from one another, but we can trade the notes. I'll film some videos and send you some stuff. Okay. See if it makes sense and we can trade ideas. Yeah, perfect. I'm looking forward to it. And I think jujitsu needs this kind of thing too. I mean, it's one thing to say, okay, technique today, we're going to do De La Hiva to a back take and then, okay, let's go to sparring. And then nobody's ever done that technique ever. You know, they're going directly to trying to smash the guy down with your forehead and, uh, you know, jerk on his neck and then, okay, but did you actually try to apply what you learned today? You know, of course, eventually over years and years, as you say, it'll come out over years and years, but there's, there's probably a more effective way to get this skill developed if you have a focused structured path so yeah Yeah, i mean even that it's interesting you say that right because like for example i've been teaching a little jujitsu and for me the beginning with complete beginners my approach was like you need to get out of top if somebody has top mount on you you need to have an escape you need to have an escape from side mount Mm. you need to know what to do like starting off your back assuming that basically things have gone wrong Mm. for you um, you know, learn what to do in worst case scenarios. So a couple of escapes, something you can do from guard to sweep, something that, and, you know, working from that base and then drilling it every single day, no changing lesson for like two weeks, three weeks, mm-hmm. a month. Until that stuff, you can do it in your sleep. Yeah. You know what I mean? You have a solid mount escape that is going to work for you at high, high percentage. Now we can move on a lot faster because I can show you other things because you can always go back to that thing that is going to work for you a lot of the time. And I feel that that's, um, I mean, I get it. Like I like variety. I want to learn things quickly, but I feel that sometimes going slow makes it faster in the long run. I agree. In the sense, if I show you one escape today and tomorrow I show you a sweep and the day after I show you an armbar from top, there's no logic to it all, you know? Yeah. Whereas if we work for a month when you first shows up on learning how to fall, learning how to shrimp, you know, just basic motions that you use all the time, and then, uh, let's say, drilling escapes and one sweep, I think it gives you a foundation that then it becomes so much easier to branch out from, you know? Yeah. So I... Even in jiu-jitsu, I agree. I see that uh, as a big need, just the same. Yeah, I agree completely. I think that that uh, method of teaching is the way to go, particularly if you want to have long-term deep skills developed. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, maybe we're, we're, we're kicking a dead horse. Maybe some people thought of this and have spoken about this in the past, but the majority of majority of the, the, 
people doing it that I've seen today are not doing it in this way. So even myself with, uh, look, I've got habits from my teacher, my, 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 my master mm -hmm. that I add into jujitsu. And one of those habits is my teacher's adamant that if you go to training, you take a notebook. If you don't take a notebook to training, yeah. he looks at you funny. He's like, where's your notebook? Yeah. You know, and I'm with you. And I do the same you thing. Have to yeah. Yeah. I do the yeah. same thing in jujitsu. Uh, I take notes. So my subway ride to, to grappling or to wrestling or whatever I'm going to is an hour at least. I mean, I live in the north of Beijing. It's far from everything. But I like that hour because I sit there writing notes on my phone uh, in the notepad about whatever I want to do that day or a problem that I had or something that I realized and learned that day on the way back. When I'm with my master, I take a pencil and a notebook and you know, if he says something that was important, I'll write it down because even the act of writing it down, even if you say, no, 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 I remember it with your brain. But even if the act of writing it down somehow ingrains it in your head even further, just the act of writing it down, even if you never look at it again, because you've remembered it. And yeah. only because most people, I mean, I think you and I have the same nerdy tendency to do that. Yeah. And I think it's very important because it allows you to... I think it allows you to understand the art at a deeper level faster. Can you become amazing at it without it? Yes, of course. You can be a fantastic athlete. You can be, you know, you can have all these things that allow you to pick up things quickly regardless. But I think that a more, a little bit of an intellectual understanding of it all can allow you to cut some corners mm -hmm. and move a little quicker through things and understand at a deeper level and ultimately teach better. Because, you know, a great athlete will absorb everything super quick. They may be able to do that for themselves, but they are never going to be able to explain it to somebody else yeah. who's not as athletically gifted. Agreed. So I think, like, the approach, even if it did make you better at practicing, which I doubt because I think it does, but I think it also allows you to become a better teacher, which is something that you would not. That's why usually, you know, the some of the great coaches were not always the best uh, natural people in the world. Because if you are natural, then you never had to struggle. It's like they show you a move twice and you're like, OK, I got mm. it. Whereas if you are, like, no, it doesn't make any damn sense. And you have to break it down step by step. Then you know exactly when your students are going to run into problems. You're like, oh. I remember that I've run into that exact same thing and let me save you a bunch of time by telling you exactly how to why this works and what you need to do. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, my teacher used to explain this to me used to say to me, do you know why I'm writing and telling you these things? He said, because I ran into these problems and it took me two mm -hmm. years to figure them out. But I want you to be able to overcome that problem in two months. Exactly. So, yeah. You know, and, and, you know, he comes from a generation where you don't ask your teacher too many questions. You just shut up and do it, right? His own, yeah. his own Xingyi teacher was illiterate. Everything was taught mm -hmm. through, through, he memorized everything. All the poems, right. all the classics were in his head. And that's how they taught. That's yeah. why a lot of those poems and those, they rhyme because it's the easiest way to remember the, the things. But we don't need to rely on that. We can write as well. So this is, again, coming back to this idea of modern tools, right? So writing and recording even video is a modern tool so writing things down great record it as well great use all these tools because it's going to help you so i think it's important mm -hmm. i think it's important before you know it we can do the matrix right yeah. you, you can come and after a few minutes you go like i know Kung Fu. <laughs> exactly exactly so speaking of which the the, the, the sequel is coming out soon so I'm looking, I see. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Well, I've taken up most of your evening. Uh, it's been a really good discussion. It went by in the blink of an eye. Maybe we can do it again in the future, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. So definitely. And I would love to, uh, uh, like, I would love to do this again in the future. And I would love to trade the uh, martial ideas. Maybe we'll trade some videos or something. I would love to see some of you your shingy material sure i would be more than happy if i can send you anything judo it's related and um that would be fun oh, that'll be perfect i'm looking forward to it so let's do that all right sweet all right well you have a good evening thank you once again and um i'll put whatever I'll, I'll be in contact with you afterwards to put whatever contact or whatever relevant information you want public out there we'll put it in the show notes etc so i'll get that from you 
Oh. All right. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Bye bye. Have a great one. Bye bye.